Hello, my name is Jason Demore, and welcome back to By Faith Bible Studies. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at wisdom from a humble lens and humble wisdom, and this idea of that a growth of wisdom leads to an understanding that you are lacking in wisdom. This idea that our wisdom, no matter how great it is, is nothing in the face of an almighty God, an all-knowing God. And we're going to be continuing our study looking at wisdom and humble wisdom in chapter 8, verses 10 through 17. And as I read these verses, I want you to notice something. Notice how repetitive it is, repetitive the passage is. How many themes are being stated again and again and again. And so I want you to ask this question, how is it so repetitive and why is it so repetitive? What is Solomon's point in repeating his themes over and over and over again? This is going to be a message that's more of a summary of everything we've looked at before. However, I also want us to ask another question. What is new? What is the point of this repetition at this particular point in Ecclesiastes? And why is he saying it here to make what new statement? And maybe you'll even notice things that I haven't noticed and I'm not even going to be able to mention here because I didn't notice it. And so I hope that through this study in verses 10 through 17, we will strengthen our understanding of the things we've learned in the past, but also added, added nuance to everything that we have learned. So let me read the passage, chapter 8, verses 10 through 17. So then I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is vanity." Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. There is vanity which is done on the earth, that is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this, too, is vanity. So I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun, except to eat and to drink and to be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun." When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover, and though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. This is the word of the living God, the words of Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, inspired by God the all-wise one. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that the wisdom of Solomon, enhanced by the wisdom of your grace and your Holy Spirit, Lord, would influence our hearts, Lord, as we really look at this summary passage of everything we've learned before, but also that we will be reminded again of these themes that life is vain, yet there is so much meaning in this life, and that meaning is found in you, Lord. Lead us to be wise, but to live humbly in that wisdom and let us learn more and more about you. Amen. And as I said, this passage is more of a summary passage, and the two summary statements that I feel that are here are fear God and be happy. Fear God and be happy. Verses 10 through 13 tell us to fear God, and verses 14 through 15 tell us to be happy. It's things we've looked at a million times in Ecclesiastes before, but they are said here again, and so I will not skip over this passage. We're not going to chapter 9 yet. We are going to look at these verses again as a reminder of everything we've looked at before, but I hope also we'll get some new added benefits from looking at these themes. Fear God, be happy. Verses 10 is a very interesting verse because if you look at the middle of the verse, it says this, I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This passage right here is a thing that we have seen many times in Ecclesiastes, a sort of, sort of proof of the problem of a fallen world. The proof here is that wicked men are able to get fame, and they are able to get glory, and they are even able to have power in the holy place. 
in the time period of Solomon, those who were in high power were probably also high power of the church. It wasn't a theocracy, but it was close. Think of this. Solomon, king of Israel, was the one who dedicated the temple. No, he was not the priest, but he was high in power. And so what he's saying here is that kings, mighty people, those in power, those who are even in the church are wicked, and they are given fame, and when they are buried, there is glory given to them, and their names are remembered. This is proof of a fallen world that those who have done evil are remembered as heroes. But this phrase is sandwiched, and it's sandwiched by things that we know are true. It says here, so then this is vanity, and at the end it says this is vanity. And you see not actually the word vanity in the beginning, you see the wicked buried. Instead of saying vanity, he says they're buried to show that they too die. And their actions are vanity. And we know vanity as this idea of breath and short and not lasting and meaningless. But I think there's vanity being nuanced here to another extent in this idea that, yes, you may have seen the wicked and you may have seen them being glorious in the holy place and doing well, but it's a lie. And what I mean by that is these stories of the wicked succeeding are outward appearances of the wicked. If we look at their hearts, if they, we look at their real lives, they're probably not nearly as happy and glorious and amazing as we think we they are. Rather, it's vanity. It's pointless, and they too understand probably that their outward appearance, their celebrity status, is vain because it is just a mask for the hard reality of their hearts. I mean, we saw this in verse 9 where it said, Everyone is hurt, both the oppressor and the oppressed. People are unhappy, and the glory of the wicked man is vanity. However, regardless, even if it is true that it is not really accurate that the wicked always reign, there are wicked people who rule. There are wicked people in the churches who are seen as the great ones. But they are also forgotten, and they are buried, and they are thrown aside. But it's easy to forget all of that, and it's easy to be envious of the wicked. It is easy to be envious of the wicked. I don't care how many times I read the Bible or know that the wicked are evil or know any of this, I can still often find myself being envious of the wicked, those who have the power, those who are in control, those who get what they want, those who seem happier than I am. Even if it is a lie, it seems like they are more happy than I could ever be. And so it becomes easy to be envious of the wicked. And the reason is it goes on in verse 11. It says here, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, this idea here of it seems that the sinner does well, and so why not do evil? It is so easy to be envious of the one who gets everything their hearts desire. They are happy, they live for a hundred years, but the reminder here is that way of life is vain. In this idea that it's really not true, the core of that lifestyle is wretched. So that's our first reason why we ought not to be envious of the wicked. It is that it is a lie crafted by Satan, that these people live a hundred years, that these people are ultimately happy, that they are perfect individuals. Rather, they are wicked, evil sinners who are probably very unhappy and do not have the eternal joy that is found in God and God alone. But our second reason why we need to not be envious of the wicked is that God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. At the end of verse 12, it says, Still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. This is the truth. This is a lie crafted by Satan to believe that the wicked man lives longer. Yes, he may in certain instances, but the truth is that that's honestly not the pattern the wicked man may live longer, but they may be unhappy, broken, destitute. They do not have God. 
So this lie is then matched with what we just read, that God is a jealous God. Let me turn with you, let, may you turn with me to Exodus 34, 14. In the midst of a passage telling the Israelites to stay away from the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites, telling them to not be part of them, telling them to destroy their altars and to kill all of those people because of their evil, it says here, For you shall not worship any other god, for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Do not be jealous of the wicked because God is a jealous God and if you are jealous of the wicked God will be made jealous and he will destroy you God wants all worship for himself and he deserves to have all worship for himself and so he will shorten the days of the wicked he will destroy the wicked he will destroy them it says here because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly that doesn't mean that it's not executed it just means it's not executed quickly according to our timetable. But as we looked in chapter 3, it is according to God's timetable. And he will destroy the wicked. So do not be envious of the wicked because God is a jealous God. And he will destroy those who choose not to worship him. We are called to bow down to him and worship him alone and to be righteous and humbly wise. Understanding that this idea that the wicked are the greatest is a lie crafted by Satan. And God is a jealous God, and if you listen to that lie, he will destroy you. And that sentence, though it may not come quickly, will come. And your life here may be long, but your life eternal will be longer in eternal damnation. Something else that I think is very fascinating here as it looks at the fear of the Lord is... Often in the New Testament and also in the Old Testament, I've looked at this as we've looked at Ecclesiastes and even Kings, is this idea of a heavenly mindset. That the way to break free from the struggles of the world is to have a heavenly mindset. What I mean by that is this idea that if we know that we will be blessed in heaven, we can endure the hardships of this world. If we know that we are entitled to glorification in heaven, then we can endure the insults of this world. But in no way does Solomon say that. It is not a heavenly mindset in that sense. It is stark fear. And in fact, I hate the word entitled because yes, by the grace of God, we will be glorified in heaven. And yes, by that, we should have a heavenly mindset. But that heavenly mindset needs to be one of stark fear. Fear. Fear that there is a sentence against the evil one. Fear that God is an almighty God. Fear that God is a sovereign God. And this is not a new theme. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3 verses 14 through 18 say this. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it and there is nothing to take from it. For God is so worked that men should fear him. That which is has been already, and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what is passed by. Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man, for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. God will judge on his own terms, and by that we should fear him. This theme is then stated again in chapter 5, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 6 says, Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Stop focusing on the things of the world. Stop focusing on these things. Watch your mouth, guard your steps, and fear God. And then chapter 7 states this again. Chapter 7, verse 8. 18 says these same words it is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other talking about not being overly righteous as in the pharisee and not being overly wicked as in the foolish person for the one who fears god comes forth with both of them this theme of fearing god is not new it is something that has been repeated over and over again and as we come to the end of a, another section in ecclesiastes we hear a call to fear god again 
because wisdom and righteousness is founded in fear, stark fear of God, the heavenly mindset that causes us to want to be sanctified in wisdom and righteousness is founded in stark fear of an almighty God who could destroy. But what is fear? Well, we talked about this before, that fear is love defined. Fear is love defined. It is love that comes to an extent that you understand that you do not deserve God's love because of how evil you are. It is love that understands that Romans 8 says nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It is love that is taken to an extent of understanding how little you are and no matter how much wisdom you have, you will never be able to be on the status, status of God's wisdom. He is greater than us. He knows more than us. He is more powerful than us, and there is absolutely no way that we could ever be as great as he is, yet he loves us. This is the fear that we are ought to have, and it should cause us to understand that God is a jealous God. We do not need to be, we should not be envious of the wicked, because God will destroy them. Rather, we should realize that God is a jealous God. We need to ignore the lie of the world, throw it aside, understanding that God will destroy the wicked, but he will also judge the righteous. And if we do not have a right stance with God through the power of Jesus Christ, then we will be destroyed. A fear of God is a right response. Having that heavenly mindset of entitledness is so wrong. Rather, we should have a humble heavenly mindset and a stark fear of an almighty God. This is our first call. It is to fear God, verses 10 through 13, a theme we have heard over and over again, but really further enunciated, further pounded into our brains. Another thing that's very important here that I notice is it says at the end, but it will not be well for the evil man, but it says that it will be well for those who fear God. And I think that word well is very important because we often think of fearing God as a area of terror and that it is a response to that terror, but there's really nothing else there. But it's important to understand that there is good things that come from fearing God. Turn with me to James 1, 12 through 18. I think James 1, 12 through 18 does an excellent job at addressing this and the reason for that is because when we think of godly blessings blessings that come from god we often think of that heavenly mindset but i think it's important to understand that both are true and both are being talked about here and i think the cross reference of james 1 12 through 18 connects both heavenly blessings as well as temporal blessings and shows us that both of these come from god and that when we fear them fear him we will experience these Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him, eternal life with God. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. An excellent reminder that God is not the causer of evil in the world. Rather, it is the hearts of evil man. He has allowed evil, but he has not, in a sense, put it forward. He is not the one who tempts. It is us who tempt ourselves by our own evil desires. Very important to understand that we cannot blame God for the evil in this world. And then in verse 17, it says, Every good Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be kind of first fruits among his creatures. And why I think that this connects to temporal blessings is because he just talked about trials, the hard things of this world. God does not bring those along. That is not his gift, his trials. He is not an evil God. Rather, he is one who gives blessings and gifts. And this contrasts the lie that the wicked man always prospers. 
The reason that I know God will bless me in the future in this temporal earth is because he has blessed me in the past. The reason I know that there is eternal life in the future is yes, because of the Bible, but because of the abundant blessings that he has given me here. He is the father of lights, and when we fear him, he will bless us. That is not the reason why we should fear him, but rather it is the reason we should fear him more and love him more because of how undeserving we are of these good blessings, both eternal blessings, but is also the realization that we are first fruits of his creatures able to dominate this earth in a way that is reciprocal of the Garden of Eden in a sense of that yet not perfectly yet we are given blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing how often we ignore these rather we should rejoice in them and love them and cause us to fear God more because of how undeserving we are that the Father of Lights would give perfect gifts to us over and over again Yes, have a heavenly mindset, but also have stark fear. And have an understanding that when we have that stark fear, there is blessings, earthly blessings, that will make living on earth palpable, easy, happy, and joyful in Christ and in Christ alone. Verses 10 through 13, fear God. Verses 14 through 15 take us through our second reminder. It is to be happy. To be happy. It says here in verse 14, a very similar statement that was said in verse 10. I'm going to do the exact same thing. You get the essence in the middle. It says this. There are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. Once again, a proof that there are problems in this fallen world. It is proof of a fallen world. Yet, we have vanity nuanced once again. Because this phrase talking about this evil that's in the world that the righteous man gets wicked things happening to him and the wicked man has good things to happen to him is a lie crafted by Satan. There is This is vanity. Not only is it true that when this happens it is not lasting and it has no eternal significance and really is only a temporal thing, but it's also true that the wicked man does not have the greatest blessing of all and that is the blessing of God's friendship with man. It is vanity to think that the wicked man has it better off than the righteous man. And we know this from everything we've read in Ecclesiastes before, that it is to better to be righteous than to be foolish. Because the wicked man will be destroyed. He will be destroyed. Because the sentence against an evil deed may not come quickly, but it will come. And the evil man will be judged by God. So this is futility. It is vanity. It is ridiculous to dwell on the evil that comes upon the righteous man, but rather to dwell on the blessings and the joy that comes upon him who lives in union and unity with God. And to really build on this statement, he says here in verse 15, so I commended pleasure. Yes, there's evil in this world, Yes, life seems to be vain, but I commended pleasure. Be happy. Be happy. What a statement that we seem to ignore sometimes in the Bible or think it's not there. We dwell so often on pick up your cross and follow me daily. And we forget the verse that's so close that says, Put my yoke upon you, for it is light and it is easy, and I will help you and I will carry you, and I will carry the cross with you and for you. This is the truth. Be happy. Life is easy with Jesus. Though at times it seems hard, let us be happy. Commend pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. This is not something new. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes 2, Ecclesiastes 2, 24. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? For to a person who is good in his sight he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. Well, to the sinner he is given the task of gathering and collecting, so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight 
This too is vanity and striving after wind. This is stated after our twofold introduction, both the cosmic introduction as well as the personal introduction. It's the closing of that section, and it is a call to be happy. At the end of the section talking about God's sovereignty, or my bad, in the middle of the section talking about God's sovereignty, it says this, verse 12 and 13 of chapter 3, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. And at the end of chapters 4 and chapters 5, talking about dealing with friends and also dealing with riches, it says this in verses 18 through 20 of chapter 5. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself and all in one's labor, in which he toils under the sun, during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is his reward, temporal blessings from God. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. I love that last verse. Let me read it again. It's so fantastic. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. The anxious man, the sinner, the wicked man, the man who thinks he can have control is constantly thinking about yesterday, he's constantly thinking about today, he's constantly thinking about the future, he's stressed, he's anxious, but the man who has God, knows God is sovereign, goes, I'm happy. And that's all I need right now. I need to fear God and be happy. And that occupies his heart so he doesn't need to worry about tomorrow, he doesn't need to worry about his sins of the past because God has carried them. Jesus has carried them. All he needs to do is be happy. Fear God and be happy. Be happy. And this statement is stated again, obviously, in chapter 8, verses 14 through 15. A cross-reference that I'd like to look at is Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says this, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. From an Old Testament standpoint, we have so much to thank God for because of the everyday blessings of God, the bread on your table and the drink in your mouth. But from a New Testament standpoint, we have even more because we know Jesus. We have read the Gospels. We have experienced, if you are a Christian, the love of Christ we know the death and resurrection of Christ intimately. We know Christ intimately. And because of this, let us rejoice all the more. Let us sing louder than Solomon could even understand to sing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Philippians is full of this call to joy. How much we have to be joyful for. Let us be joyful. And I love how it says here, the Lord is near. This can be interpreted as the same idea of death is knocking on the door. So fear God and be happy. And let your gentle spirits be known to all men. Let the smile on your face be a way that you can share the gospel. May your smile cause other people to fear God, cause other people to realize how much they need him, how much they want him. Be anxious for nothing. Be occupied with joy. And then it segues into prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let us not only be joyful, but let us be gra grateful. Let us pray to God in thanksgiving. Thank him for his blessings, his everyday blessings, and the blessing of Jesus Christ. And the blessing of Jesus Christ that he is daily in supplication for our souls. 
This is what we have to be thankful for, and it is so much. And I am such a negative person, and I am quick to not be thankful. And I hope that reading this passage will encourage me to be happier more often, and that a fear of God should even cause us to be more grateful, to be more joyous, because as we understand how undeserving we are of God's love, how great He is, how small we are, May it cause me, may it cause you to be happier, more joyful, and sing louder. And also, this joy leads to a peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. This peace I have definitely experienced before, and it is incredible. It is a peace that causes you to forget about the worries of the world, it is a peace that causes you to stop asking God, why would you allow evil in a fallen world? It is a peace that stops looking at Ecclesiastes from a cynical, pessimistic lens and leads you to read it with a smile on your face. It is a peace that surpasses all understanding. The wise man who tries to understand everything will never understand this peace. A peace that God and only God grants and a peace that should cause us to rejoice again and again and again. And that joy causes us to fear God more, understanding how undeserving we are of that peace. How can we have peace in the face of an angry God? Dwell on that for a moment. How can we have peace in the face of an angry God? Because he has chosen to send his son. Because he has chosen to love us. May that cause us to fear him more. May that cause us to be more and more joyous, more happy. Fear God, be happy. Something else that's important to look at in our passage is... Something I really just stated, but I just want to state it again, is that a lack of understanding in no way means a lack of enjoyment. I think a, a lot of non-Christians, maybe atheists, would think this, that I must understand more and that will give me enjoyment. But that's not true. I mean, it says here, all comprehension, which surpasses all comprehension. Peace, which surpasses all comprehension. Is a lack of understanding does not lead a, to a lack of enjoyment. Give me a silly example here. I... I cannot fully understand why God has allowed evil into the world. I have Bible verses. I've listened to sermons on it. It still doesn't fully make sense. But I can't understand the wonders of a donut and how amazing that is. And this is a silly example, but it illustrates my point of that lack of understanding should not lead to lack of enjoyment. Rather, lack of understanding should lead to humbleness and trust in God and thankfulness and more enjoyment. Lack of understanding should lead to more enjoyment because we are enjoying things we fully don't understand. And really, trying to understand leads to more joy, but that never, understanding never ends, so we're able to get more and more joyous over the glories of Christ. I could read Ecclesiastes a million times, and I'd learn something new every single time, and I'd be happier every single time. And it's funny to say that I'd be happy reading about death, but it's the truth because we deserve eternal death and that is why we fear God. But we are happy because he has freed us from that. And he has blessed us both with common grace of the bread on your plate and the drink in your mouth, but also with the death of his son on the cross that leads to eternal happiness with him in heaven. The other thing that I want to state here about being happy is that this is not in any way positive nihilism. I may have mentioned positive nihilism before, but basically what it means is that nihilism is the idea that everything is meaningless, there is no God, and so everything is meaningless. Positive nihilism is this idea that if, if there is no meaning, then everything matters. And where I'm getting this from the passage is where in Ecclesiastes 8, it says this, so I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and drink and be merry. So this could be misinterpreted as stating, there is nothing good, so let's enjoy life. Let's have good things. There's nothing good, let's have good things. That's a paradox, and really what positive nihilism, and I give it quotation marks because it's silly. If there is no meaning, then how can there be meaning in the things you do? If there is no meaning, how can you enjoy life? That doesn't make any sense. 
Positive nihilism dwells on this idea of if nothing I do matters, then the only thing I matters is what I do. Ooh, cool, philosophical. No, it's silly because it's a paradox. It doesn't make sense. And it's a paradox rested in your own understanding, your measly little brain that doesn't understand anything, and we are full of lack of understanding. Christianity is founded in paradoxes founded by God. We have the paradox of predestination versus free will, which I will never fully understand. We have the paradox of the Trinity, one and three persons, where there is no way to fully understand that. We have the paradox that the first will be last and the last will be first, and it goes on and on. But none of these paradoxes really define Christianity to that extent. They're not like that way. Rather, they are not paradoxes. What I'm trying to say is they're not paradoxes in human understanding. They are paradoxes that God fully understands. He fully understands how Jesus can be Son of God and Son of Man. He fully understands how He can have predestined everything, yet we are totally responsible for our own actions. He fully understands how the Trinity works. So they're not actually paradoxes at all. The paradox of everything is meaningless, so everything has meaning, that's a paradox. That makes no sense because it's rested in human understanding. Nihilism says there is no God. This is not positive nihilism. What we do not understand, he understands completely. And positive nihilism says, I don't understand it, nobody understands it, but it must have meaning. That's silly. And I think this really increases the power of these verses because it causes us to fear God more. There are things we don't understand. Why is there a fallen world? Why is it like this? Yes, I can read verse after verse after verse, but it fully doesn't always make sense. But regardless, it makes sense in God's eyes, and I trust him in that. And there is verse after verse after verse that says he fully understands. He knows what's going on. He wrote the Bible, and he knows what is in between the lines. He understands everything, and in that we can trust. It's not blind faith because there is evidence upon evidence, but understanding that those paradoxes that we see in the Bible are founded in a God who understands every single one of them. And to him, they are not paradoxes at all. Do not think that this is talking about a paradoxical philosophy. In no way is Christianity full of paradoxes. In no way is there inerrancies. Absolutely not. Rather, it is an understanding that we need to fear God and be happy, understanding that he understands every single paradox. This is not positive nihilism. Now that we have that out of the way, we have gotten through our two main points. It is to fear God and be happy. But I've left out three verses, and I'm sorry, two verses, verses 16 through 17. And as I read these verses, I want you to listen to them and understand how remembrant they are and how much they reflect everything we've learned before. I'd label verses 10 through 13, fear God, and verses 14 through 15, be happy. And I'd label verses 16 through 17, and listen to the chorus. Because I think 16 through 17, as well as this entire section, is a sort of chorus of Ecclesiastes. Let me read it to you. When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should, sh should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. In these two verses, our three truths are repeated. We see the fallen man, the fallen man who cannot sleep day or night because of the trials of this world and the reality that he is fallen. He cannot discover the work which has been done in the sun. He is fallen. We see the sovereign God where it says in verse 17, I saw every work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done in the sun. God knows it. We do not, but God is sovereign. And we see the vain life, the wise man desperately trying to say, I know, I know, but he cannot discover. We have our three main themes, the fallen man, the sovereign God, and the vain life repeated again. So it is really a chorus, and it is a call to listen to that chorus. And so this is my answer to that question I asked earlier. How is this repetitive? Well, I've shown you, but why is it so repetitive? And I think it's repetitive for two reasons. First of all, 
Repetition is necessary because it's so easy to forget. Ecclesiastes is almost a stream of conscience. And what I mean by that is Solomon is not only talking to his people, he's talking to himself. He's opening up his heart to his people and to himself. And he needs to repeat himself so that he does not forget. I had a good friend who's been also going through Ecclesiastes and he said, I'm reading these things and I'm depressed. That's why we need passages like this to bring us back to the truth, to remind us life is not meaningless. Death, if you have Christ, is a beautiful thing that leads us to Christ eternally. Be happy and fear God. Repetition is necessary because it's so easy to forget. We constantly need to be taught humility. We constantly need to be bowed to fear God. And we need to be reminded to be joyful. How often are we prideful? How often are we envious of the wicked? How often are we negative? This is why we need these passages. We need these reminders in our life. And this is why Solomon is repetitive because he knows his own sinful heart and he knows the sinful hearts of his listeners. And so he's repetitive because we need to remember these things over and over and over again. And so as you read the story, the poem, the beautiful wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes, understand that that repetition is necessary because it's easy to forget. Repetition also enhances meaning. Every time that I've looked through this idea, we've looked at fearing God and being happy, you learn something new and you enjoy it more and you get something more out of it. When I looked at fearing God in chapter 3, it was awesome. And when I looked at chapter 5, it was more awesome. And when I looked at it chapter 7, it was even more awesome. And now we're looking at it again and it's like you're learning more and it's more awesome. And being happy as well, we looked at chapter 2 and it stated something about this meaningless of life, meaninglessness of life, which it's not meaningless, it's only breath. And we saw that we're supposed to be happy in that. And then we looked at God's sovereignty and how we're supposed to be happy in that in chapter 3. And then we looked at the things of earth and how we're supposed to be happy in that in chapter 5. And then we're looking at it again in chapter 8. And the increased knowledge and the increased understanding, it causes you to just love it more. And it enhances the meaning and it grows our love for God as we love Him more and learn more about Him. And it's, it's a sort of refrain and a poem that causes it to come back to these truths and enhance their meaning and add something new. So I hope as you've looked at this, that something new has popped out to you, not only as a reminder, but something new. And this really main message of Ecclesiastes becoming more and more clear, which is to understand that yes, we are fallen. God is sovereign. We live in a vain world. Life is vain, but we are called to fear God and be happy. These are the two statements that he's going to say in his final conclusion in chapter 12. And we're going to learn these things over and over again. And I hope as we see these repetitive statements, we will understand that it is easy to forget these things and that's why we need them. But also, it enhances the meaning. So I end with this. Fear God. Be happy. And also, Next week, I will not be on here because there will be a guest speaker going through chapter 9. Chapter 9, the first few verses, was the reason why I wanted to read Ecclesiastes. I read those, listened to the sermon on that passage a while back, and it was really just heart-wrenching and informative, and it led me to want to study Solomon and study Ecclesiastes. So to hear from a different perspective and from a younger Um, speaker is going to be really, really awesome. And I'm really excited to see what he gets out of the passage. Hopefully I'll get some new learning from it. And the repetition of hearing the passage again will remind me of what I have forgotten, but also enhance the meaning of the passage. I'm really excited to hear this guy um, speak and I'll allow him to introduce himself next week. So thank you so much for joining on and hearing this repetitive passage. And I will see you all in two weeks.